Hey guys, uh, we're gonna get right into it today. Um, right back into the Hobbit. Um, so yeah, let's let's pick up where we left off. <clears throat> a big jug of coffee had just been set in the hearth. The seed cakes were gone, and the dwarves were starting on a round of buttered scones. When there came a loud knock, not a ring, but a hard rat tat on the Hobbit's beautiful green door. Somebody was banging with a stick. Bilbo rushed along the passage, very angry and altogether bewildered and bewildered. This was the most awkward Wednesday he'd ever remembered. He pulled open the door with a jerk, and they fell in on top of one another. More dwarves. Four, in fact. And there was Gandalf behind, leaning on his staff and laughing. He had made quite a dent on the beautiful door. He had also, by the way, knocked out the secret mark that he put there the morning before. Carefully, carefully, he said. It's not like you, Bilbo, to keep friends waiting on the mat, and then open the door like a pot gun. Let me introduce Biffer, Bofer, Bomber, and especially Thorin. At your service, said Biffer, Bofer, and Bomber, standing in a row. Then they hung up two yellow hoods on a pale green one. Also a sky blue one with a long silver tassel. This last belonged to Thorin, an enormously important dwarf. In fact, no other than the great Thorin Oakenshield himself who was not at all pleased at falling flat on Bilbo's mat with Bofur and Bomber and Biffer on top of him. For one thing, Bomber was immensely heavy. Thorn indeed was haughty uh, and said nothing about service, but poor Mr. Baggins said he was sorry so many times that at last he grunted, pray don't mention it, and stopped frowning. Now we are all here, said Gandalf, looking at the row of 13 hoods, the best detachable party hoods and his own hat hanging on the pegs. Quite a merry gathering, I hope. <clears throat> Sorry, I hope there is something left for the late comers to eat and drink. What's that, tea? No, thank you. A little red wine for me. And for me, said Thorn. And raspberry jam and apple tart, said Bo uh, Biffer. And mince pies and cheese, said Bofer. And pork pie and salad, said Bomber. And more cakes and ale and coffee, if you don't mind, called the other dwarves through the door. Put on a few eggs there, Gandalf called after him as the hobbits stumped off to the pantries and just bring out the cold chicken and pickles. Seems to know as much about the inside of my larders as do I myself, thought Mr. Baggins, who was feeling positively uh, flummoxed and was beginning to wonder whether a most wretched adventure had not come right into his house. By the time he had got all the bottles and dishes and knives and forks and glasses and plates and spoons and things piled up on big trays, he was getting very hot and red in the face and annoyed confusticate and be bother these dwarves, he said aloud. Why don't they come and lend a hand? Lo and behold, there stood Balin and Dwalin at the door to the kitchen, and Feely and Keely behind them. And before he could say knife, they had whisked the trays and a couple of small tables into the parlor and set everything out afresh. Gandalf sat at the head of the party with 13 dwarves all around, and Bilbo sat on a stool at the fireside nibbling at a biscuit. His appetite was quite taken away. I'm trying to look as if all was perfectly ordinary and not in the least an adventure. The dwarves ate and ate and talked and talked, and time got on. At last, they pushed their chairs back, and Bilbo made a move to collect the plates and glasses. I suppose you will all stay to supper, he said in his politest, unpressing tones. Of course, said Thorin. And after, we shan't get through the business till late, and we must have some music first. Now to clear up. Thereupon, the twelve dwarves, not Thorin, he was too important and stayed talking to Gandalf, jumped to their feet and made tall piles of all things. Off they went, not waiting for trays, balancing columns of plates, each with a bottle on top, with one hand, while the hobbit ran after most, squeaking with fright. Please be careful and please don't trouble. I can manage, but the dwarves only started to sing. Chip the glasses and crack the plates, blunt the knives and bend the forks, that's what Bilbo Baggins hates. Smash the bottles and burn the corks, cut the cloth and tread on the fat, pour the milk on the pantry floor. Leave the bones on the bedroom mat, splash the wine on every door. I can't sing. <laughs> Dump the crocs in a boiling bowl, pound them up with a thumping pole, and when you finish to fanny your hole, send them down the hall to roll. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates, so carefully, carefully with the plates. And of course, they did none of these dreadful things, and everything was cleaned, and put away safe as quick as lightning. While the hobbit was turning round and round in the middle of the kitchen, trying to see what they were doing, 
then they went back and found Thorn with his feet on the fender. Uh, and wherever he told one to go, it went. Uh, behind the clock, onto the mantelpiece, or under the table, or around, around the ceiling. But whatever it, but wherever it went, it was not quick enough to escape Gandalf. Pop! He sent a smaller smoke ring from his short clay pipe straight through to one of Thorns. Then Gandalf's smoke ring would go green and come back and hover over the wizard's head. He had a cloud of them, about him already, and in the dim light made him look strange and sorcerous. Bilbo stood, stood still and watched. He loved the smoke rings. And then he blushed to think how proud he had been yesterday morning of the smoke rings he had sent over the hill. Now for some music, said Thorne. Bring out the instruments. Feely and Keeley rushed for their bags and brought back little fiddles. Dory, Nori, and Ori brought out the flutes. Bomber produced a drum from the hall. Biffer and Bofer went out too and came back with clarinets that they left among the walking sticks. Dwalin and Balin said, Excuse me, I left mine in the porch. Just bring mine in with you, said Thorne. They came back with vials as big as themselves, and with Thorne's harp wrapped in a green cloth, it was a beautiful golden harp, and when Thorne struck it, the music began all at once, so sudden and sweet that Bilbo forgot everything else, and was swept away into dark lands under strange moons, far over the water and very far from his hobbit hole under the hill. The dark came into the room from the little window that opened in the side of the hill, the firelight flickered, and it was April, and still they played on while the shadow of Gandalf's beard wagged against the wall. The dark filled all of the room, and the fire died down, and the shadows were lost. And still they played on, and suddenly first one and then another began to sing as they played deep-throated singing of the dwarves in the deep places of their ancient homes. And this is like a fragment of their song, if it can be like their song without their music. I'll just read it this time. Far over the misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away at break of day to seek the pale enchanted gold. The dwarves of yore made mighty spells while hammers fell like ringing bells in places deep where dark things sleep in hollow halls beneath the fells. For ancient king and elvish lord, there many a gleaming golden hoard. They shaped and wrought and light they caught to hide in gems of hilt of sword, on hilt of sword. On silver necklaces they strung, the flowering stars on crowns they hung, the dragon fire and twisted wire, they meshed in light of moon and sun. Far over the misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away ere break of day to claim our long forgotten gold. Goblets they carved there for themselves and harps of gold where no man dwells. Delves. There lay they long, and many a song was sung and heard by men or elves. The pines were roaring on the height, the winds were moaning in the night. The fire was red, and it flaming spread. The trees like torches blazed with light. The bells were ringing in the dale, and men looked up with faces pale. Then dragon's ire, more fierce than fire, laid low their towers and houses frail. The mountains smoked beneath the moon, the dwarves they heard the tramp of doom. They fled their hall to dying fall, beneath his feet, beneath the moon. Far over the misty mountains grim, to dungeons deep and caverns dim, we must away, ere break of day, to win our harps and gold from him. Um, okay, I'll stop there, um, and then we can pick up next time. Uh, there's, there's gonna be quite a few moments like that in this book where the dwarves or, uh, any of the party begin to sing. Um, <clears throat> as you heard, I don't have a good singing voice, but, um, it's a little different, um, and it's, it's, it's fun. And I, I know that it's a little difficult, you know, um, for, you know, some of you to keep yourselves entertained or, you know, happy 
but that's why we're here. Um, that's why I'm doing this. Uh, and that's why you have all of us at BP to constantly be there even though we can't physically see you guys. So this is our way to hopefully bring you guys' day up a little bit. Um, and yeah, um, I hope you guys are all safe. Um, and I will see you here next week with the next part of the book. Have a good one, guys.